So I have like a million questions and they range from, you know, what is, what is interferon, which means that some people get severely sick and others don't, to how much virus do you shed if you're asymptomatic? You know, what are, research are you working on to, to try and better understand this virus? Yeah, there's a lot of things that are going on now um, in terms of understanding what the virus is doing to the person that's getting infected and how that varies from person to person. Interferon is one of the important things. Uh, we know that the virus, uh, interferon is a, is a compound your body makes in response to a virus infection, and usually that can slow down how the virus replicates. Um, viruses, however, have evolved means to limit interferon production, and there are now some new studies that are coming out suggesting that a small percentage of people who have um, inherent problems and making interferon are actually much more susceptible to the severe disease uh, induced by SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. So that opens up a whole new area of trying to understand the interferon response and how that may be one of the factors that's uh, driving this different type of disease that people have after infection. Um, were you, you know, Dr. Pekos, when you look at some of the things that we still don't understand, you know, how much of, you know, what percentage of the population is walking around that has COVID-19 but without symptoms, and, and how do we actually try and track those? Yeah, so one of the one of the biggest problems with tracking SARS-CoV-2 has been the fact that um, unlike other viruses that have emerged in the human population, this virus causes um, a significant amount of people to have infections that don't provide very strong symptoms. And some of the estimates can be anywhere from 20 to even 40 percent of infections can be asymptomatic, meaning you don't have those standard coughs and sneezes and fevers that are associated with an infection. But those people can be capable of transmitting the virus to others. So there are these for lack of a better term, a silent carrier of the disease. So it's great that these people aren't getting ill, but we have to realize that they're still capable of transmitting the virus to others. And um, if you're not showing symptoms, you may not be as vigilant in terms of your social distancing and wearing your masks and other things. So it represents an important population that we need to target for the greater good, for the public health community in general, uh, to make sure that we reduce the number of COVID-19 cases. Is it getting less deadly or is this just wishful thinking? Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's an important question. Um, we know that the medical community has gotten much, much better in terms of treating the more severe cases of COVID-19. So you're seeing hospitalization rates and death rates differ. Death rates are going down, hospitalization rates are stabilizing a bit. So that's telling you that people are still getting sick, but that the medical care they're getting is now better and they're able to survive the infection more. Um, we still don't know if the virus has changed significantly during its time in humans. There have been some studies that suggest perhaps it's gotten a little bit more transmissible, but there really hasn't been a major change in the virus yet. So what we really think is going on right now is that the medical community is better at treating, we're better at testing, we're better at identifying those cases, and now we can actually track the virus much more carefully, um, as long as all those things are put into place effectively, um, to be able to uh, minimize the severe effects of the infection. Do you believe, Dr. Pekosh, in herd immunity, the idea that if enough people actually get the virus, then it protects the population as a whole without a vaccine? Yeah, so this has been an important question that has come up uh, in many forums this year. Uh, herd immunity does exist. Herd immunity is what we'd refer to when a certain percentage of the population gets antibodies uh, against the virus and therefore is protected from infection. And we know that if most people have antibodies, then even the ones that aren't that don't have antibodies can be protected from infection because there's so few susceptible people around for the virus to find. So that concept does exist. How close we are to getting herd immunity to SARS-CoV-2 is actually not very controversial. We're actually very far away from having herd immunity to SARS-CoV-2. You know, estimates are maybe we've got 10% of the population at most that, uh, in the U.S. that has been infected so far. That's come at a cost of 200,000 deaths. Herd immunity usually kicks in around 50 to 70% of the population. So I 
don't think that anybody would want to try to achieve herd immunity in the way that we've been dealing with the infection so far. This is where vaccines are going to help. Vaccines will help boost that number, and eventually we can get there. But herd immunity is not a realistic way of dealing with this um, pandemic at this point in time, nor will it be for the next six months or so. Given what we know about vaccines now, would it actually protect people from not getting the virus or could people still get it if they had the vaccination but just not die from it? Yeah, and this is the critical thing that the phase three clinical trials are going to show us. And again, there's a, about eight or nine of them going on right now at various stages of completion. Those clinical trials are going to look for individuals who were vaccinated and tested for COVID-19 to see whether they're getting infected, and if they are getting infected, how severe are their symptoms? Because those are the two things we really want a vaccine to do. An ideal vaccine will prevent severe disease, and it'll keep people from spreading the virus to others. Um, we'll probably settle for a vaccine that does one or the other, but we ideally want both.